If I were to hire someone from my channel to help me edit, I would want to pay no less than $450 a video. That's Tony Santos, a YouTube editor with over a decade of experience working with people like Thomas Frank and Noah Kagan. With his own YouTube channel, Tony has built a reputation for helping creators and editors communicate in a more positive way, which makes him the perfect person to teach us how to find, hire, and work with great YouTube editors. I think just finding the right person and knowing who to trust is equally as important as knowing when. In this episode, you'll learn where to look for an editor. The biggest way I personally find jobs is actually on Twitter. That's probably the best way to do it. How to evaluate a potential hire when you're not an editor yourself. Try to break down and see and notice the things that they've done. The more you can kind of see their work and try to break it down, the better questions you can ask. And much, much more. Thank you to Artlist for sponsoring this video. Let's let's imagine that I've started to post on YouTube. I've been editing my own videos, or maybe I'm just wanting to get started on YouTube and I haven't edited my own videos, but I don't have the skill set. Where do I go to find editing talent? Ooh, yeah, you know, there's there's so many ways now. So like, if you need an editor, you can, for example, let's let's talk then social media. On Facebook, there's like a, a group called I Need an Editor. Uh, which an editor can join and you yourself can join as someone who's looking to hire and you can find editors on there. You'll just post your job posting, you list all your requirements and you'll either get a yes or no on the people. Outside of that, there's ytjobs.co. So that's a website that I've talked about on my own channel a bit, reviewing some job postings, but people who are also editors or other kind of creatives, like you can be like a script writer, a thumbnail designer, you can post your own skills on there and find work on that website as well. The biggest way I personally find jobs is actually on Twitter. So on Twitter or X, however you want to call it, I just make sure that my whole Twitter is based around my job, which is that I'm a video editor, motion graphics guy. And normally through there, just through word of mouth or even just in engaging in tweets is how I find work a lot. And I think that's probably the best way to do it is to find somebody who immediately has a link to their body of work, or they can at least kind of steer you to that. Because in that way, it's kind of easier to weed out who's more serious than not, which even then that's hard to say. But I, I just, I know I've met some people who are kind of in it for the money and I'm just not that kind of person. So I kind of want someone who's more craft uh, engaged and like excited for the work rather than how much can I squeeze out of everyone I work for. So you didn't mention uh, Upwork or Fiverr, which mm. is something that people bring up a lot when looking to hire freelance help. Uh, so what's, what's the deal there? Uh, honestly, it's only cause I don't have any experience in it. I have never once used those websites and I have known more people who use it that don't like it as opposed to do, which don't get me wrong. There's that website exists for a reason. I'm sure there's people that like it, but I don't want to speak on it since I don't have really experience on it. The folks that you've talked to, I'm assuming you, you mean editors who have used it, who don't like it, or did you mean creators who have hired from it, who don't like it? Uh, both. I, I, I've met more editors who told me they don't like it. And I think it's because, see, this is where like my lack of experience comes in. So I don't know how it works, but I think it's because they feel they have gotten more people reach out to them for work, but it's, it's more like, gosh, I sound ignorant here when I'm about to say, but it just sounds like from their perspective, it's more people on there looking for a bargain rather than looking for really good talent. And I don't know if that's true or not, but if that is the case, then I myself don't want to be on there then because that's not what I'm there for either. So do you think that there's plenty of editing talent out there to go around and we just need to do a better job of looking elsewhere to hire or change what we're expecting in hiring? Yeah, it's it's a mixture because like now that I know so many more editors, I know the reason a lot of people don't like dedicate to one creator, let's say. Sometimes it's not even the fact that they don't like the work. It's really sometimes just comes down to even money. You know, like it's better to have five high paying clients than just one client who's kind of giving you the bare minimum. And sure, there's going to be promises along the way of if we do better, you'll do better. But sometimes people just need the better now. Because when it comes to a lot of it, whenever I would hear someone say like, oh, I really need a good editor for my channel. Who do you recommend or whatever? I usually find it as they're just looking for someone that can kind of be there, kind of like a right-hand person. And it's not even usually like a skill thing. I usually think that it just comes down to a compatibility issue. 
Um, Because some people hire editors nowadays, and there's a lot of us out there, but they'll hire them. And the, the editor they're specifically hiring is someone who is strictly on like a freelance basis, meaning you're not the priority, you're one of, let's say, many clients. And that's why I like to strive for when you hire someone, you should get someone that is dedicated to your team and your mission, uh, because in that way you have them full time. But then also there's going to be that time period of adjustment. You know, like I've been editing for 15 years, so I have 15 years of knowledge that has nothing to do with you and your channel. And if I come in to help your channel, I need to now learn your processes, the way you like things. And that's all something that happens over time. Uh, so I, I think technical skills can always be learned. It's more just, you got to just make sure that the person you're looking to hire is in it for the long term. And it's a mutual beneficial situation for the editor and the creator as well. So when do you think I should be considering hiring an editor? Like when am I ready to hire somebody? Because it sounds like part of the issue is a lot of times people start hiring too early in terms of what they can afford or they have the wrong expectations perhaps. So at what point do you think somebody should make this a priority on their team? Well, even, it's funny you ask because even now, let's say for my channel, like things are slowly picking up and I have a lot of work I have to do. Realistically, given my workload, I would love help. And there's a certain amount of money that I would wanna pay someone for said help, but, I'm not financially there yet to promise anyone anything, so I just don't do it. And I think that's a good testament to what I think a lot of us should think of it as, is like, sure, I could use the help now, I would love someone to take the the workload off of me, but am I paying them fairly? And can I can I have this person be around with me to make sure that they have consistent work and can I afford said consistent work? Because I think that a lot of people, when they hire, they, they want to... They really want someone to help them to take the channel to the next level, which again, I personally love doing that. That's why I like to take occasional side work. But again, it's more just, I think if you can actually afford even just one video a month and you can negotiate that with the editor, then I think you're ready. I think once you understand that this person's livelihood is going to be part of something you have to think about every month and you can handle that, then I think even just business-wise, you can do it. Um, but I will say that I think just finding the right person and knowing who to trust is equally as important as knowing when to hire. Because that process is going to take a while, which I think, you, I don't know if you've experienced that with anyone that you're working with, but did that take you a while to even find someone? One second, Tony. Uh, I'm getting a call. I need to take this. Yo. Yo. What's up, man? I am editing next week's intro. And I don't know, it just feels like it's missing something. Like what? It just doesn't feel complete. Oh, just use Artlist, the sponsor of today's video. Artlist is your all-in-one platform for creative assets that will take your videos to the next level. Need to find the perfect song to set the tone of your video? How about sound effects to immerse your audience at the beach? Hiking through the rainforest? Exploring a city? Use Artlist. We use Artlist for all of our videos and love it. It completely leveled up our podcast intros, which was a huge catalyst for growth on this channel. And with Artlist Max, we can get music, sound effects, footage, and motion graphics templates for one price without having to worry about any of the licensing. Sign up with our link in the description and you will get two free months on any annual subscription. Thank you to Artlist for supporting the channel. Yeah, I mean, our our producer and editor is Connor, and I knew Connor uh, at least a little bit for a couple of years before we even started working together. He actually pitched me on coming to work with a channel, and you know, now the last two years that we've been working together, certainly have gotten to know each other a lot better and uh, found some of the strengths that he has that I wasn't even aware of, or different ways that he can flex into the role and and do more. So we'll we'll for sure talk about finding the right person here, because a lot of times this is this is the, where I'm making this video in the first place. People ask me, how do I find a good editor? How did you find Connor? And my answer is like, unfortunately, Connor found me. Fortunately <laughs> for me, unfortunately for you, the person I'm giving advice to. So I'm, I'm trying to find more consistent uh, ways to recommend this, but something you just, something you touched on that I think 
could be really insightful because you are an editor. You have been hired at different levels. You know, I know when you first started, you were hired at $30 per video, and then you were doing $350 per video with Tom when you started. And now you're into thousands of dollars per month on retainer. So as you're thinking about, it would be nice to hire somebody to help me with my channel, but I'm not sure I can pay them what I would want to yet. What does that look like? How are you thinking about what you would want to pay somebody uh, given that you have been in that seat before? Yeah, actually for me, it's I just got to make sure that I am not doing something that feels hypocritical. Like, I, like, again, I've been doing this for so long and I started and gotten payments in so many ranges. Like I've been paid $10 a video, $30 a video. A guy tried to negotiate with me $80 a week and it was five videos a week, which I almost took, but that's just cause I didn't know any better. And the thing is like, ever since I met Thomas, that was my real eye opener as to what is possible given the right mindset. And then also just working with the right person that understands you as well. So for example, if I were to hire someone from my channel to help me edit even like my own interviews that I'm doing, I would want to pay no less than $450 a video. And the only reason I stick to that number is because I want to do slightly better than what Tom was able to do for me when we first started. And I also understand the idea of progressively scaling from there. So I would talk with the editor like, look, I can maybe only afford one video a month. But as long as you're there with me, you collaborate with me. And like I, like everyone says, as the channel does better, we will do better together. But again, I also understand that I am not then going to be their full-time uh, employee or uh, uh, what do you call it? Like creator. So I cannot be upset if they take all their side work. You know, like the, at the end of the day, I understand them and I hope that they understand me where we can collaborate and know like you have all the time in the world to do all your other projects. Um, but for me, it's 450 and we'll take things from there. That's a helpful benchmark. I want to see if there are any other embedded assumptions into that figure. Mm -hmm. When you think about $450 per video, are you thinking about the length of the videos that you want to create or how in depth those videos are? Because videos come in all shapes and sizes, right? $450 for this right. video over here probably feels a lot different than $450 for this video over here. So how do you think about the type of work that you're doing? Uh, and I wanna talk about geography here in a second as well, but let, let's let's see what else is baked into that figure. Well, it's funny, cause even saying that, I have a lot of conflicting issues in my head because now that I've gotten to meet so many editors, like I, I finally know people now that we even work in Hollywood and I, I'm happy to say I have friends there. So the more that we discuss even how they work, their day rates, um, there's also a group called the Blue Collar Post Collective. And in, in that group, they do a wage survey every year where anyone in the production sphere can go ahead and, and put how much money they make that year, what their job title is, how long they've been doing it. And you can use that as a method to compare your salary based to other people at certain jobs. And the more I got to understand that part, the more I understand both how hard it could be to get something sustainable on YouTube because we don't all have all this big money like companies do to pay an editor. But at the same time, I have to understand like I can't pay an editor pennies because uh, if I do, then I feel like I'm being hypocritical to to basically my my own people, so to speak. So like, yeah, one video that costs 450 for me would be like my interviews that I do. And that's because they take normally 20 to 30 hours to make. So I like to think of it like, okay, let's say for 450, I were to hon uh, hire, let's say Connor, like you said, but Connor was like, hey, I charge $50 a, an hour. Then I would say, okay, I have 450 I can spare. You do as much as you can with that 450. Um, and whatever it is, it ends up being that and I'll, I'll finish it up. Like, I think it's because I'm so in the weeds now and I understand so much more. It makes it hard for me to find the right number, but I'm happy with 450 as I don't think that is the worst that I feel is out there. Yeah, this is this is good nuance because what you've kind of just touched on there is this uh, collaboration of finding out what is possible for editing this one piece of content. Because what you've what you've said there is that you're you're kind of assuming that the editor themselves has a value on their time. So mm -hmm. you're saying this is what I value the output. So if I'm coming to you because I think your work quality is good but this is my budget for the output of one video and you're valuing your time at $50 per hour, that would mean that this output is gonna come out of nine hours of your time. 
Do you do you think that most editors have a figure like that in mind so that when you come to them and say, I can offer $450 per video, they can do that math and say, okay, well, if I think my time is worth $30 per hour, I'm going to put nine hours in. Or do you think they're thinking just about how, how can I do my best work for $450? Yeah, it, it's definitely both. Like I, I know enough people that there's there's sometimes projects that we take that are on a per project basis. And someone right now could say, oh, I'll happily edit one of your videos for $450. That sounds amazing. But given that I know how much time it takes, I also let them know like, well, on average, it takes me 20, 30 hours. If you don't feel like 450 is enough, then just give me the amount of hours that you feel you value to give me, um, which I know is probably not like the be- the best business strategy, but I can't pretend that I don't know how a lot of this works. And I would feel really guilty doing otherwise. I don't know. I, I want more editors to definitely think of it that way. And I also want creators to think of it that way as well. Because it's very easy to say $200 for a project sounds great, but that's an easy way for an editor to get stuck with a project that's going to take 30 hours. You do the math. Like, did you really make that much hourly or would you have gotten a better job elsewhere, even working like a regular job that would have paid you more? Um, and I definitely don't want editors to feel like they always have to take jobs like that, especially coming from me. I, I, I don't feel good doing that. Yeah, I feel like the conflict can come from misaligned expectations. Because if if I'm the creator and I'm saying, I'm willing to budget $450 per video or whatever the number is. Mm-hmm. I also probably have some set of assumptions in my mind as to what that final work product should look like. And if I just go to the editor and they say, sure, I'll do a, I'll do an edit for you for $450. And they have in their mind, here's how many hours that I'm willing to put into this at that price. There's a good chance there's a disconnect yeah. between the final work product of what the creator might've been mm-hmm. expecting and what could be accomplished in those hours. So if I'm hiring an editor and having these conversations, how do I have those conversations? How do I make sure that we're on the same page and we're aligned with not just the price, but what we expect the work product to be? Should that be on the creator to start that conversation or will the editor push that forward? Honestly, I think it could be, it can be both, but I do think maybe the creator would start that conversation more. It's just because like, I'm thinking back when I first started with Thomas and when Tom mentioned that he was gonna pay me $350 to edit an entire video, I was mind blown. And that was because no one has ever offered me that much. The most I've gotten at that time, I believe was the $80. And so I was ecstatic. But the thing with Tom that I knew um, that factored into me accepting this was that this is something that he wanted long-term. So when something is longer termed, you can negotiate and have less pricing but that's because you're at least getting consistent work. And then you also know that there's a growth factor to this that has been discussed. But a lot of times when editors get approached, or at least the ones that I've met, they always tell me it's always like on a per project basis, they expect the world for like 300 bucks. And that's when they realize that this project took $30, they couldn't do the other work. So I think the creator, the more they understand how much or how much work goes into their own videos, I think it's easier to bring up the conversation, like here's how long it usually takes me. Um, you know, I can maybe promise you two videos a month. So from there, what do you as the editor think? And the editor could then try to think like, okay, well, I could swing that. I can afford that. I'll take less pay because this is a long-term agreement, not just once a month or something, or even just once and call it quits. So I think the creator, as long as they understand their own videos and what they expect from the editor, then I think those conversations can be easier because Sometimes editors don't even get those kind of questions. They're just more being told what to do and they have to either accept it or the person leaves. Do you think it's more common for editors to hear project-based pricing as the offer or hourly or retainer? What do you think what do you think is the most common and what do you think is optimal all things considered? I think in the online space per project is definitely the most common because it's even what I usually would agree to as well. Even though technically, if I know if I broke things down hourly, sometimes it wouldn't be as worth it. But the reason I do per project is because I try to remember, like, as long as this is a long-term thing, I will always accept less money uh, for consistency rather than trying to maximize my dollars per hour. But I think the... I think the reason it's also easier on the online space to do per project is because they at least know that for this whole video... It could take you five hours to make. It could take you X, X amount of more hours to make. 
like no matter what, you at least know you're getting that money that I hope was in writing and it was promised to you. Um, so then you can just start to play with that number and you start realizing as an editor, like, okay, these take me like 10 hours to make. Uh, maybe in the future we can renegotiate a higher price or after these 10 hours, I can squeeze in another client to make more money. To sum all that up too, when it comes to even something like hourly, I know a lot more traditional people who would tell me that editors should be charging hourly. The trickiest part about that that I've experienced is what you said already, which is the expectation that people have of you. And let's say you hired me and you're like, all right, I want this video done. But you never told me how long it would normally take you. And let's say it took me like 15 hours to edit the video in completion. But you tell me, hey, that should have taken you 10. And it's like, why should it have taken me 10? We never agreed to that. I never said I was going to take 10 hours. So then now the editor is going to somewhat be punished because the person that hired them had higher expectations that was originally discussed. And I also think that's very unfair. So that's why I tell people, if you do hourly or if you do a per project, get it in writing, kind of like a contract, because I know how so shady some people can be. And uh, that's not good for the community if we do things like that. I've freelanced a little bit too. It wasn't in video editing. It was in things like marketing and website building. And I've realized a lot of times freelancers don't have business experience. And so a lot of these conversations happen after the fact because they haven't experienced a conversation before and because they don't know what might happen if ex expectations are not aligned. And it can start relationships off on a difficult foot. So you know, I, I'm trying to educate the creators here and how they can set both parties up for more success. I've also realized as a freelancer, sometimes it's dangerous to depend on one major client for your income, because if this is work for hire and this is truly freelance work, there's not a lot of security there. So do you think that editors in a freelance capacity do you think they prefer working with multiple clients for security? Or do you think most editors actually prefer working with a smaller number of clients, maybe even just one consistent client? I would say depending on the editor's work-life balance and what they strive for, I, I would say it's probably best to work with less people who pay more uh, as opposed to a lot more clients who pay somewhat okay. Um, and the only reason for that is I know the mental health capacity that comes with that and juggling so many clients can definitely be a pain. Like I even struggle just juggling too sometimes. And the reason for that is because the amount of time that I put into the projects that I work on, it's just not a good situation for me. So yeah, I would say if, if editors are out there listening too, or even like for the creators out there, like if you really want someone, uh, we're probably more inclined to stick with one person longer term as long as you pay more. Uh, just because then our needs are covered, we understand there's growth, we understand the the potential of what can come from this. And, you know, that values a lot more than 10 people who are only giving me a hundred to make a thousand, as opposed to Thomas can give me a thousand as long as I dedicate my time to him. And I would definitely do that. You gave us a really helpful number on if I was thinking about project based and you said typically approaching somebody with a project based number is helpful. If, if I'm interviewing editors and they're giving me hourly rates because that's what they're used to, what range do you typically see as common uh, or appropriate in an hourly basis? Uh, yeah, that one's tricky because it depends on where you live. Uh, it can be statewide, country, depending on the country. If you're a new editor, you can just Google like what's a starting rate for an editor. And let's say it's like $21. Uh, then use that as your own metric. Like there's no right or wrong answer. So then you would just start at 21. But then if you feel you're more experienced and you can back up your experience and you can show the clients you work with, then just continue raising the bar. There, you know, no one's stopping you. Like, not to, you know, make anyone feel bad. I, this opened my eyes, but I learned there's like this one guy in Hollywood who his day rate, which is how much he makes a day, is two grand. And I was like, holy cow, I never knew that number was possible. And he probably never thought that either until his clients valued his time that much that they pay him now for that. So it really will just depend on how much you value your time, where do you think your skill is, and can you back up the claim? Because uh, nowadays, if people want to work with me, like, I'll be honest, my, my time is now valued at $100 an hour. Um, and if someone wants to pay me less than that, I have enough experience to know that they, they are then not giving me enough value money-wise 
that I should just put my time into Tom because we have enough going on that is more than worth it. Um, so I'll just stick with Tom as opposed to taking, you know, the lesser paid job. But even then, remember, I, I keep things very um, dependent on what the project is and who approaches me for work. I would love to share that right now on my channel, I am focused more on creating content that really speaks more to both editors and creators, especially the new series I've started where I'm talking with friends that I have both in the online space as well as in Hollywood and traditional media. For example, one of my interviews was with my friend Andy Young who works at Warner Brothers. And we talk about stuff like our, our pay, how we went from YouTube to Warner Brothers, um, the kind of questions that like you should be asking when it comes to your pay. Um, and he shares so much more insights that I think are so valuable that only you would learn if you were doing uh, the kind of work that we do. Okay, so let's say that I, I take your advice and I go on social media and I find someone in the editing community and now I'm starting to see, okay, well, Tony's talking to Connor and Connor's talking to this person. So now I, I can like see the the growing network of editors in this social network. And I want to reach out to one of them and say, hey, do you have any availability? How should I navigate that conversation? One, what should I be looking for? How do I know that this person might be a good fit for me? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I would suggest uh, always keep things professional. And that goes for anybody. Like, I, I personally don't like it when people message me saying, yo, because I'm like, we're not, no offense, but like, we're not friends. So I'd rather you just approach me. Hey, bro. Exactly. I think personally, the best way that I like to get messaged is who are you? Um, what are you messaging me for? Uh, give me some links to the bodies of work that you've worked on and are looking for me to work on as well. Any inspirations? So if you're like, oh yeah, I'm making productivity and lifestyle. My biggest inspiration is Matt Diavella. That gives me so much context immediately as to what this person's looking for. And then lastly, please just put the amount of money that you're considering paying me because that can always be negotiated, but also... I, I just like to be realistic and like, I don't want to get so excited for a project until they say, well, I can only afford $50 a video. And I'm like, well, if I'd known that prior, I could have easily told you, I'm sorry, I can't take that. Um, so don't be afraid to throw out numbers either, but just keep it as a range, um, you know, just so the person, if they reply to you, you know already that they kind of already said yes in a way to a lot of what you're stating. If I, if I see somebody's public portfolio, how should I as the creator look at that and consider it, you know, am I looking for, okay, this is exactly the style that I'm going for. So I know I'm good, but if I don't see exactly my style, then it's not a fit. Is that, is that true? Or is there some other signal I can be looking for to see that this might work for my channel? I think something that, I mean, it's hard to really know how somebody completes their work, but what I normally would do then um, whenever I meet someone and I want to see their skill set myself, let's say someone goes to Thomas Frank's channel, they look at a video that's been edited, right? So when you watch the video of someone you're, you're going to potentially reach out to, as you're watching the video, try to break down and see and notice the things that they've done. So you'll notice like, okay, so there was music, there was B-roll, oh, there was animations. Did they create those animations themselves or was that templatized? Um, the music choices are great. Is that something that the editor is doing by himself or is he getting help from the creator? Um, th those lower thirds are great. Again, were those templates or were those custom? The reason you wanna start breaking down and asking these questions is because you'll also know as a, as a creator, I'm looking for someone that can work with templates or I'm looking for someone that is a motion graphics designer, but then that's a whole skill set on its own. So the more you can kind of see their work and try to break it down, the better questions you can ask. The, the editor, because then you'll realize like, no offense to the editor, but you know, I don't have templates. I was hoping you can make them. Then you can gauge their skill set right there. And then even you would be like, you know what? Maybe this, this isn't a fit. And now you know you need a motion graphics designer as well, not just an editor. You just mentioned that uh, motion graphics, totally different skill set. So if I'm looking to hire a video editor, I shouldn't expect that they can do animation or motion graphics. I, w I wouldn't say you shouldn't expect it because there's so much that you can do in video editing software. It's more just like, like I, I've actually been contacted before to give perspective here. Um, there was this big music company and they wanted me to edit a trailer. And they specifically said, edit a trailer. And of course I asked for context, right? 
So we agreed, we went through this. And then at the end, when it came to like finally delivering the project, they somehow assumed that I was a 3D, 4D uh, animator and like designer that knew Blender and all this other stuff. I'm like, when did we ever discuss that I had that skill set? That's, that's a whole other person, you know? So the reason it's, it's good to understand the differences in skill sets, it isn't because someone isn't like as good as another editor. It's because not every editor, even in traditional, like in Hollywood, not every editor has that skill set. So if someone has that, that just increases the value for the person. And I know plenty of people that know uh, both Premiere and After Effects like myself, but I have to be real too. Like if you want a lot more animations and custom work, that has to be involved in the pricing. Uh, Cause I could just do that in Premiere, but you know, it, it is it is a separate, se uh, separate skill set. It, it is two people working together technically, so. So it sounds like it'd be useful for the creator when you reached out to somebody or made uh, a job posting about an editing role to have very specific examples of what you're trying to uh, achieve, whether it's videos from your own channel or videos from another channel, so that even if you are unaware of some of the elements that are inherent in these videos, at least an editor looking at this and considering this role can see these different elements, understand if they're a fit, maybe have that conversation to say, hey, there are aspects of this uh, video that, um, are a different skill set? Are you looking for somebody who can also do motion graphics? Because that might not be me. Right. You know, part of this is putting a lot of onus on the creator. If you're watching this, you may be thinking and feeling that way. But I think it's actually a good thing because in my opinion, the more educated you are when you start the conversation with an editor, I think it reflects really well on you as the creator, as someone to collaborate with. Because at some point, you know, you're going to be competing for high level talent. You know, you want, if you have the resources, you want to hire people that are great to work with and people who are great to work with want to work with other people who are great to work with. Yep. So the more educated that you are and, and, uh, preparing and understanding how you can have a good working relationship, I think it's worth doing that effort to start the, the relationship off relation, relationship off on a good foot. Yeah, and then I also would say too, even if um, even if you don't know any of this, which again, I don't expect anyone who isn't in the weeds to really understand how they grow. It's more just, if you know how to approach even just your first editor with questions of, you know, I want someone to do this, I want someone to do this. And let's say the editor tells you, nope, can't do it because X, Y, and Z, or I can't do it because of the money, or I can't do it because that's a whole skill set. Don't be afraid to ask like, oh, who would I look for then? Or what would be a more appropriate pricing? Um, which everyone's gonna give you something different, but the the knowledge usually remains the same, which if someone says $20 isn't enough, and then you go to another editor and they say, no, the price should be 30, at least you start gauging like, okay, so maybe 20 to 30, 30 to 50. So your pricing will, your experience in the pricing knowledge will increase. But then the more you ask about the editing, the more you can start picking up what it is that certain people do and don't. Let's talk about workflow. If I hire an editor and we agree on the price, it's a project price, it's some number of hundreds of dollars uh, per video, how should that workflow actually work? Or how should I expect that workflow to work? Because I can't just be like, okay, go to work. I at least have to record material, right? But what else should I be expecting to do before handing this off and saying, okay, come back to me with a final product? Yeah, the most I ever ask for someone is be organized. So try to have some kind of file structure, which usually can be something as simple as a folder with the project name. Inside that project file, then you have like a folder for A role, B role, your pictures, your actual project files for whatever software you're gonna use. And then try to provide as many assets that the editor will need right away so they can just sit down and work rather than have to go Google a lot of pictures or consistently ask you for B-roll. I mean, that's gonna happen regardless, but I think the more you just have things prepared for the editor, uh, the quicker turnaround you can have. Uh, I know plenty of people who have given me a, just just the, like the raw recording and they're like, okay, go. And then as I'm editing it, I'm like, oh man, I'm missing so much B-roll or you keep mentioning this one product, but I don't even know what that product is. I never heard of it. So I have to uh, just immediately start asking questions rather than being able to focus on the work itself. What expectations should I have in terms of 
timelines with my editor and revisions. Those should definitely be established um, even prior. I think that should be part of the negotiation. The reason for that is because I've known plenty of people who will tell me that this is a simple edit, that this will not take you more than 10 hours, and I agree to it. And then they don't factor in the revisions and they expect 100 revisions, which is just adding so much extra time to what was originally priced and negotiated. So not only is this person now like really um, like being, I don't want to say picky because it's like, it's a creative process and you can be as picky as you want technically. But at the same time, I can't give you the world if we didn't agree to it. I would say if you're going to talk about revisions, you should limit them. Uh, maybe like two to three at most. And it's for the editor's time as well as the creators. But then also it's so you don't get so perfectionist about every single thing you're going to upload that you're more focused on the revisions rather than just understanding what isn't going to work in this video, accept it, and then just improve upon it for the next one. Kind of like the 1% rule. You focus on one little thing each time and you'll get better over time anyway. Something that I think I've improved with over time that I had to learn by experience is that not all revisions are created equal either. Mm. You know, saying, hey, there's a typo in this on-screen text is a different revision request than, hey, this motion graphic you put together, let's actually change this structurally. It, it might come with a ton of extra work and time that you as a creator don't realize. Mm -hmm. So in the revision process, I found that it's helpful to have a conversation when you, when you do want to make a change about hey, this is something that I see. Is the juice worth the squeeze here? Because sometimes if you have a deadline to hit, especially some revisions, you it's a hill that you don't want to die on <laughs> because <it's, laughs> right. it might not make the the amount of difference in the, the quality of the video and the final product versus the amount of time and the, the project setback that it would take to edit it. Yes, no, 100%. It's it's like a running joke also with a lot of us where um, like the the picture could say like creator, hey, the, the first draft is great, but can you change the music? And then the editor's crying and it's because we synced all of our cuts to that song that now we just added 20 hours of extra work without even realizing it. Now, that isn't to say that revisions won't make a video better or what have you. It's just... The more you understand what you're asking, the more you can think to yourself, it is not worth spending another whole day editing this because our deadline's Friday. Let's just chalk it up to, we'll improve on this next time and then just move on. Because then you're, you're just kind of living the lesson then, which is that not every video will be perfect and you can't expect that. Um, at least in my opinion, I'd rather make little bits of mistake that I can fix in my next video than being perfectionist on every single thing I work on. What type of direction can you give the creators watching in terms of how to provide feedback to your editor? Because I think the the temptation is to be very um, very utilitarian, very like direct, and just say this bad, change this, do this. But I imagine there are types of feedback that you receive that are more helpful and maybe even received more positively than other types of feedback. So if you could share some of the feedback that is not helpful or some feedback that is especially helpful. I would like that. So a good example of this um, can easily be with the way Tom and I work. So Tom is very, he has a very good eye for like design. And I don't feel like my design levels are up to par with his, if I'm being honest, but I trust his feedback enough that it will make the project better. But what I don't want is feedback. For example, if I gave you like a project and this animation, I don't know, maybe the animation, like a keyframe is off, or maybe it just didn't hone that point across. I wouldn't want you to say, this is bad. Make this image come in faster and change the background to blue instead of white. Like there's questions in that, that I'm going to ask. I'm like, okay, so was the timing off? Did the, like, if I said that the point didn't come across, how did it come across then? So I can kind of chalk it up in my head as um, Jay likes things like this because Jay thinks that the animations in general look better when they're quicker. So I'm learning about you as a creator. So like the more feedback I get that is specific with good feedback, the more I can understand how to edit in the future. Because if someone came in to edit a video for Thomas and they showed me it, 
I'm more than sure I will probably pinpoint 20 things that I know Tom will already say no to, but that's because I got to learn him on a personal level with his kind of critiques. So yeah, just be specific and just try to explain why you feel a certain way about things because I have to learn about you too. How do you as an editor think about preferences of taste for the creator that are different from yours? And mm. when you indulge that versus when you say, hey, I disagree and here's why. Because I think I think the best work is often when if there is a disagreement in some way, there's a conversation, you collaboratively come to the best decision. But I think in a lot of freelance relationships, it's like whatever the creator says goes and we make that whether we think that's the best decision or not. Well, at first I will tell, I would tell the editors that are listening if there are, which is that don't take everything personally because at the end of the day, we're here for, you know, to help the client with the work. And I want to do a good job to whatever metric that that client would say I did a good job in. But at the same time, I want to build enough trust between the person I'm working with. Uh, again, I'll use Tom as an example where I don't feel like just letting them know like, hey, changing this graph, I don't think is really going to make it better. And it's just going to waste time. I think we should focus on this instead. And you, once you build that trust though, it like hopefully it signals to the creator or whoever you're working with that I understand what you're telling me, but I don't think that's really a problem. I think we should do this instead because I'm trying to think of the video project as a whole rather than just one little part. Because again, it goes back to what we said that like not every round of revisions is, is equal. And I think the more trust you can build, the easier it can be to just say, I will do it. I disagree. Here's why. And hopefully even then the editor or the creator can learn from the editor about how an editor can see things. You know, and then at the end of the day, you're kind of mixing each other's skills, which is what I believe in, is a synchronization between the editor and the creator. I think that'd be always great. You mentioned earlier that a lot of times when these relationships start, there's a promise of if we do better, you do better. What do you think about the timeline of when uh, creators offer a raise in pay? When should we expect our editors to ask for a raise in pay? How do we how do we think about that? How do we think about when when pay should increase? I mean, that's hard to say. I can't speak for everyone's finances, but I, I will say if the business is doing better and this person is probably your only client, uh, your only like, I don't know, I don't want to say employee, but you know, person that they're working with, um, then it doesn't hurt to just give them more money. If someone's doing good, they should be rewarded to some degree or another. And then also you have to remember like the editor... It, it, like if I see a channel, if like if I was working for you and we worked together for a year and the channel went from 70K to 200K, um, then with that, there might be a view increase, there might be more sponsorships. And I don't have to be like a huge business person to know that we're probably making more money. And I want to think that my contribution to the company is causing that. Then it doesn't hurt to just say, hey, Tone, you know what? We are killing it. Um, I can't afford to give you much, but what about an extra... $200. Like it just also shows that you do care about my well being, and I don't have to worry about looking for a client that's going to do that for me. So I just think, yeah, if you're doing better, the people you work with should get some of the reward for that, you know, because especially if they're there in the trenches with you, I think there's nothing better than being able to reward the people doing the work with you. I agree. From the creator perspective, I really try to hire for the long term as much as possible because. It is so expensive to try and hire somebody new, do all of the, the time of coming together and understanding like your visual style, having a shared vocabulary, understanding how you mm -hmm. work together. Hiring yes. new people is very expensive. So setting the relationship up for the long term is really something I recommend if you're looking to hire an editor. On our channel, um, Connor has a revenue split for AdSense, for the brand deals we bring in. Is, is that common? Do you see that in the industry? I've, I've definitely have had people ask me about that. And I'm realizing it's something that wants to, wants to get figured out more. It's just, it's always tricky. Like I, I don't have enough knowledge on that front to say like, yeah, that's great. I think it sounds great, but I also don't, um, I don't know enough to know 
like what a percentage sounds good or how to even do that depending on the channel you work with. Like some channels are so niche that they make more and they have better sponsorships. And then some are just so broadly appealing that the, you know, the, the ad revenue is less. Um, so like, can they even afford to pay someone more as opposed to this niche channel? Like it's, it's just so varying in degrees that, um, it's rough, but I will just say this, the fact that UJ allow Connor to do that with you, to get that kind of a split goes to show how much you value him. And I'm sure Connor feels valued from you from that. And that's just simple relationship tactics right there. Like I care about you, here's some more money. I mean, who won't be happy about that? You know? Yeah. It's, it's something that I want to continue to get better with. Um, if I'm honest, it, Revenue split and profit split are not the same thing. And when I look at most businesses in the space, most of them do profit splits because they recognize revenue often has to come in to pay expenses. So Mm -hmm. I want you to be compensated for what we're doing on top of expenses. And so um, if, if I'm giving advice to someone out there, I would say, think of it as a profit split rather than a revenue split first and foremost. But it's something worth considering because it aligns incentives. When you align incentives, I think it brings right. out the best work in people because they realize there is a direct impact between the quality of work that I do, the results that we get, and how that impacts my bottom line. And in the immediate term, does it feel more expensive? Of course it does. In the long term, though, I think it's I think it's um, potentially really positive. Yeah. I mean, there's one thing that you can't teach, which is, lo- I guess you can say loyalty, Um, but I'll put it this way, just to sum up, like if you show someone you care, I think that goes a long way, which is just like, it's not a secret. So I can, I can share this bit of knowledge with Thomas Frank, not only am I his editor, but I do like, like I've mentioned, like I do motion graphics for him. I know how to work the set. Um, I know how to work all of our cameras. I know set design because of our work together. I know lighting. So because I bring so much for Tom, whenever he feels like he needs it then right now I earn $120,000 a year. But that came through a progressional thing throughout six years of working together. And the last bit of it that I'll say about this is I have been offered uh, to get paid double. So someone offered me 200K to go work for their channel, but I saw what they were making. I saw kind of what my life could be like, and that sounded way worse than my life right now with Tom and every long-term goal that we're looking to achieve. And you don't teach someone long-term thinking like that, but because I got so understanding of how things work, I see so much better potential with Tom and earning less less right now, even though I know I make great money, uh, than just jumping ship to the next biggest paying client. And that's what I really want for both creators and editors to understand, think of the long-term and can we both establish that that's a future we want together. Um, Because then you'll get someone like me who's like this for Tom. And I don't think that's very common, but I wish it was. I'm glad that you shared that that example about your working relationship with Tom, because at the end of the day, if you're in this for the long term, you want the best quality people. And a lot of times, if you're getting started, you can't afford the best quality people. It's it's about helping to develop talented, aspiring, promising people into being great people. And then hopefully during that promise or that process, you've also developed a relationship that is exactly what you just said, where actually I value this relationship and the work that we're doing together now more than the pure cash play that I could have elsewhere that might have a higher near-term cash value. So, you know, as you're thinking about hiring a good editor, I think it's important to look for promise and to treat people well so that eight years from now, you have your own Tony Santos on the team who uh, is like, core to the company and knows your style, knows your language and flexes into roles even beyond being an editor. Agreed. If someone's aspiring to do more, nurture it and see what can come from it. Never know. If you want more tactical advice on building out your YouTube dream team, watch this video I did with Ali Abdal's right-hand man, Angus Parker. It is without a doubt one of the most useful videos on this channel.